right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my pleasure and privilege as president of the Royal Society to welcome everyone to this uh, lecture this evening. The Bikirian Lecture is the Society's premier lecture in the physical sciences, and it originated in 1775 through a bequest by Mr. Henry Baker, and it is intended, I quote, for an oration or discourse to be spoken or read yearly by one of the fellows of the Society on such part of natural history or experimental philosophy as the President and Council for the time being may decide. And this lecture, of course, has a very long tradition, has been given by a procession of distinguished people over more than two centuries. So welcome to the Bakirian Lecture. Before going further, uh, let me make the usual boring announcement. Please turn off your mobile phones. Uh, I say this not only because of a live audience, but because of an audience that's watching us uh, live via web streaming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I should say that our speaker today is Professor Robin Clark. And Robin was born in New Zealand, and he studied for his bachelor's and master's degree at Canterbury University College in Christchurch, focusing on diffusion control reactions. He then started a PhD at the University of Otago in Dunedin, and then he came to UCL to develop the chemistry of titanium and vanadium. And I think one of his two supervisors was uh, Professor Jack Lewis, who is here today. Robin has remained based at UCL for most of his career, although he's traveled very widely indeed, been a visiting professor in many places, and he served as Dean of Science, Head of Chemistry, and Sir William Ramsey, Professor of Chemistry. He was elected Honorary Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand in 1989, FRS in 1990, and appointed a Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2004 for services to science. And because of Robin's special links with New Zealand, we have not only the usual web streaming, but we have a live audience... Uh, they were there a minute ago. Yes. <laughs> yes. Can we get them back? Yes, there they are. And they are an audience who are at the Royal Society of New Zealand. And for them, it is breakfast time on Friday morning. <laughs> and they've had their coffee and donuts, I hope. And they're very alert. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome them. And they will be listening live, and they'll be able to join in and ask questions at the end. Um, and uh, um, I would uh, like to ask if uh, Dr. Di McCarthy is there, the Chief Executive, and if she would like to say a few words. Yeah. Good morning, Lord Reeves. It's a very special pleasure for us here in New Zealand to join our distinguished colleagues at the Royal Society of London. And on behalf of our President, Neville Jordan, and all of us gathered in the room this morning, we extend our sincerest congratulations to Professor Clark, and we look forward very much to hearing his address. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're delighted to have this very remote audience with us today. And uh, uh, with, with that, let me introduce uh, Robin Clark uh, to give his lecture, which is entitled Rama Microscopy, Pigments, and the Arts Science Interface. Robin. Ladies and gentlemen, when, when you see something such as this, which is obviously extremely artistic, wonderful design, incorporating history and paleography and what have you, you obviously admire it. But do you also admire it as a work of science? After all, the pigments there are chemicals. They're all minerals. They, know, they, they come from the ground. They, they were nurtured by chemists. They were studied. We know that they don't uh, interact with the, the material next door. That's all been looked at. And uh, I, what I want you to do at the end of this talk and just wonder whether you should view these as works of science as well as works of art. So the key to it all, all of this is pigments. And um, 
what I'm concerned with is, is the characterization of pigments. Uh, was the final effect achieved by a single pigment or by a mixture or by layers? All sorts of questions to do with restoration are very important. You need to know what the pigments are if you're going to restore with the same material. Have there been changes in color with time? There are many questions to do with conservation. Uh, some pigments are sensitive to light, some to heat, and, and some to moisture. And there are questions of authentication, and that's a word that I deplore as I'll go on in this discussion to draw attention to. Um, and the questions of assignment of a probable date to a work of art. So these are the things I want to draw attention to as we go along. And if I can control this thing. Most of the material, especially in the older um, artwork, is actually inorganic pigments. And the colour of these things originates from certain electronic transitions. They're called ligand field charge transfer or intervalence with various abbreviations. These are, these are things that people study in inorganic and physical chemistry courses. I'm not going to discuss them in particular here, except that they are well known, the particular electronic transitions which are responsible for the colours of pigments. And the depth of colour is related to the absorption coefficient here. Um, that is the, the amount of light of any particular wavelength, that is colour, which is absorbed. And it's related to the particle size of the pigments. Um, this is because um, colour is determined not simply by diffuse reflectance, which is a transmission spectrum, but also by specular reflectance, which is the mirror-like top surface reflectance. And these two effects are complementary, and so particle size does affect the depth of colour of particular pigments. And the early artists knew about this. So what are these pigments? Well, I've listed seven of them down there. Azurite, cobalt blue, Egyptian blue, thalassinine blue, lazurite, Prussian blue, and verdigris. And there are at least 20 others, which are, which are blue and quite widely used in artwork of all sorts. And the, the materials then here are, have a chemical name. They have a formula, which I won't bother about, but it's up there. The assignment, that is the electronic transition responsible for the color, is also given there um, for the scientists uh, amongst you. And also... The date. Now, if a material is a, is a mineral, then, of course, it could be thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years old. And there's no possible um, dating information obtainable from that. But if it's synthetic, then we know the year of first manufacture. And so that's the, the kernel of the idea about how you might get an idea about dating by virtue of knowing what the pigment is. And so that's the, the basis of it, and there are at least 20 others, as I said. But there also are many organic pigments and dyes which are used in artwork. Um, these tend to be much more sensitive to light than the inorganic ones are. And so the old artists did tend to use the inorganic materials if they possibly could, knowing full well that they were not <coughs> photosensitive. But some of the organic pigments and dyes are extremely well known. The indigo from the plants, uh, such as the woad plant. There's uh, material from marine life, such as Tyrian purple, which is obviously purple. Sepia from uh, the cuttlefish. Tyrian purple actually comes from this shellfish. Cochineal kermes come from insects. And saffron and weld from plants. And there are countless others. And there's a very, very big literature on all this. There are books written about, about any one of these particular organic pigments and dyes. And they were very important, but since uh, Perkin down in Greenford in 1856 discovered, first of all, how to make movine, slowly the synthetic organic um, skills have been developed 
and more and more um, organic materials, synthetic ones, have come onto the market. And in the 20th century, of course, with acrylics, this has uh, been a very big thing. <coughs> well, I just want to comment on one or two of these organic materials. Carmine, the deep red material that you're all familiar with, that does come from two different species of wingless scale insect, the cochineal in um, the ancient, um, in, in the New World, and Kermes in the Old World. It has a, a formula here, that's the formula for carmesic acid, and um, carminic acid is almost the same material. And this was a very big industry because the, um, they, these particular insects grow uh, and feed off cactus farms and big plantations in Mexico and many other parts of the world were set up simply to grow this particular insect, which was then cooked and uh, extracted from, uh, with the carminic acid or the cumesic acid. Now, in fact, it was only f th these two chemicals were only made first in the 1991 and 1978. They're quite modern and they're quite difficult to make, so in fact, the actual carmine itself is still the natural product which is used. Another one in this category, of course, is indigo. Uh, this, this was, first of all, uh, grown by way of the woad plant and extracted, and we all know about the Picts and who used to paint their faces uh, with the extract, the woad, uh, superficially anyway, to frighten away the Romans, but they had remarkable lack of success with that. But nevertheless, that was, that, was from an, that was from the woad plant the indigo was extracted originally. And then that sort of went out. And that was a big business in the whole of Europe. But that died down uh, eventually when the Bay of Bengal plant, a similar plant, but another one which had um, much more of indigo in it. And that was a big industry in the 1600s, 1700s. And eventually, of course, that was killed off as well by Adolf von Bayer, who discovered how to make the stuff and what it was. And this is the formula here for indigo. And from one patent in 1880, they went to 152 patents in 1900. And it was a big business and also a Nobel Prize for him. So that's really what's happened, that the synthetic organic chemists have taken over the development of, of pigments and dyes. So the question is, how did my group happen to take an interest in this sort of material of identification of pigments and dyes? And it was really by accident when, um, um, I think it was a library or perhaps a, a gallery called me up and said, look, we'd just like you to have a look at something. Do you think you could tell us whether the two blues down here are the same or, or different or what they are? And we looked at this, and I said yes, because we should, usually used to try just about anything. And uh, I found, and we found, that it was um, azurite, a <coughs> copper acetate material. And that, um, that was the same for both the pale blue and the deep blue. The pale blue has turned out to be three micrometer-sized material, and the dark blue, 30 micrometer sized material. So here's the old artist using one pigment but trying to make out its two, simply from their knowledge that particle size did determine depth of color. So that was, that was quite easy to do, actually. And in fact, it was so easy, I thought perhaps there could, must be much more work we could do in this context. And so we had a look anyway on this one, and the white is white lead, the, the, the green is malachite, the red is vermilion, mercury sulfide, the yellow is lead tin yellow type 1, and we also went to look for the black up there, expecting that to be carbon black. Well, it clearly wasn't, or wasn't only, because if you have a look at it, you see there's a, there's a whole mix of at least seven or eight different pigments there, and I then began to wonder whether the technique of Raman microscopy might be particularly useful here, because in the Raman microscope, you can bring the laser beam down onto each pigment grain in turn down the microscope, 
and collect the Raman scattering back. And you can do that for grain sizes down to about one micrometer. We then looked very early and, um, at this particular Bible, a Paris Bible of 1267, which Sotheby's were selling, and we just managed to get hold of it to have a look at and see whether one could apply the technique properly to works of art of this sort. And I had a, a, an email last night from Stephen Best in Melbourne who'd been warned that this is being broadcast out. And I told him, well, he's going to have to get out of bed at 6 o'clock if he's, if he's going to see this. Uh, he threatened that he would, but I, I wait to see. So this demonstrates what, what can be done. Uh, here are eight pigments, azurite, orpiment, lapis lazuli, realga, which is AS4, S4, uh, lead white, red lead, uh, malachite, and vermilion. These are, sta- these are eight standard pigments and they could quite easily be detected on this particular Bible. Well, I must then just tell you what it is I'm really talking about. I'm talking about a phenomenon of light scattering. That's the basis for the technique and the instrumentation. It goes back to Lord Rayleigh in 1870, who realised that if you brought a beam of light, monochromatic, that is, single colour, just like one of these lasers, though he obviously didn't have a laser, into a sample, in his case it was a gaseous sample, he realised that light is scattered in all directions. There is an interaction between the light wave and the molecule, such that light is re-radiated in all directions, extremely weakly, but nevertheless it's re-radiated at the original frequency. Now, there's not a lot that you we learn from Rayleigh scattering, but we need to be grateful for it because it is responsible for the blue colour of the sky. If there were no, eh, no molecules up there, there would be no Raman scattering and the, the sky would look black the moment the sun set. So uh, it has a, a side interest there, uh, but it is the essential core to this, the Ray, so-called Rayleigh scattering at the, the original frequency. Now, we had to wait a very long time and, and not to any information from the hallowed halls of um, uh, Harvard or Oxford or, or UCL, but from Calcutta, where the next advance of this was in 1928, when C.V. Raman um, realised that it wasn't just the original frequency which was scattered by um, molecules, but some and different frequencies which I've listed here as nu naught plus or minus nu i, where nu i was a feature of the molecule, a molecular transition frequency corresponding to change in rotational, vibrational, or electronic state. And and these frequencies were very, very weak indeed. But nevertheless, they're there, and it is a fact that all materials Raman scatter. Um, You may not be able to detect it, but you do need... Um, it, it's, it's there. And most of the applications of Raman spectroscopy actually relate to linking in with infrared spectroscopy to determine the shape of molecules. It's in the, these two scattering techniques, particularly if you're concentrating on the vibrational Raman effect, in which case the incident light beam with a os- certain oscillating frequency, is m- being modulated by the vibrational frequencies of the molecule it's hitting. And in that way, so the old radio hammers would understand this, you get a modulation of the original frequency so that you get some and difference frequencies coming out. And it's the difference frequency usually which is followed, and that then is a signature of what's been hit by the laser beam. It doesn't matter what you shoot the, this laser beam at. You're, there'll be a signal coming back telling me what it is that uh, the laser beam struck. And that is these difference frequencies, and which really are the fingerprints of what's going on. And how do you do it? Well, Raman had a tough time in his day. He was using photographic plates. And uh, he originally used sunlight and, uh, and then switched to other, other sources. But... Either way around, he may have had to have two-day exposures 
Well, you can now, with the use of lasers, which are much more concentrated beams of light, uh, using those, you can get down to seconds. And it's partly because the laser beam is much more powerful and coherent, but it's also because of the detector. And here we uh, need to explain, explain how pleased we are that we have astronomers because they developed this sort of char charge-coupled device detector for seeing distant stars in galaxies. Um, very weak radiation. Well, that's exactly what the Raman effect is. It's very weak radiation. The radiation is there, but you've got to be able to pick it up. And that's what these things have revolutionized. So this is just a schematic design. We've had several Raman spectrometers uh, at, at UCL, but this is the more modern design, English-made, actually, and selling very well. And the chief salesman says, he, sorry, he couldn't come today because he's in Russia selling more. The beam comes in, the laser beam comes in here, comes up, goes into the microscope, and then is deflected down onto the uh, microscope stage where you place whatever it is you want to look at, and then you collect the Raman radiation back up the same region. It goes through something called a notch filter, which tries to get rid of all the original beam of light, which is thousands of times more intense than the Raman radiation, to try and let just the Raman into here through a diffraction grating into the charge-coupled device detector. And uh, that is essentially how these things work. They, they, uh, they are much more efficient than the older versions in, in all ways. Now, it isn't, of course, Raman microscopy or Raman spectroscopy is not the only technique which is nor has been used in um, the identification of pigments on artwork and ar archaeological artefacts. Uh, Raman is one. Infra infrared spectroscopy is um, uh, an another. Polarized light microscopy, absorption spectroscopy, laser-induced uh, breakdown spectroscopy, X-ray fluorescence, X-ray photoelectron scattering, and a various other techniques down here. And even that doesn't summarize them all. Um, there are nu various nuclear techniques, which PIXI, particle-induced X-ray emission and gamma-ray emission, that's used um, in the, the laboratory of all the museums of France. That's the three-story laboratory underground at the Louvre. And most of you who've walked into the Louvre would have no idea that that's there. But if you come out of the pyramid and walk towards the Tuileries Gardens, you're walking over the laboratory, three floors of it down. And at the bottom floor, they have a cyclotron, and they can do this pixie measurements. There, they can do uh, nuclear reaction analysis, and they can do Rutherford backscattering. And this gives me uh, uh, a moment to say that, of course, the only other New Zealander to give this particular Bakerian lecture was Rutherford. And I'm allowed to shoot this beam over here, because there's, there's Rutherford uh, uh, there, and the, the camera is going to be trained on him so the people in Wellington... Can, can pick up and realise where his painting is um, in, in this welcome building. Well, there are many techniques then, and what really matters is how specific the information is that you get back in any technique. Is it sensitive? Is it immune to interference from neighbouring pigments uh, or from um, the binder or anything else there? Uh, what is the spatial resolution... Now, I've got Raman down there is less than one micrometer. That's about what it is. That means you can get a signal from one micrometer size. That's a millionth of a meter sized grain that's sitting next to another grain of something else, and you can get the signal from each. Um, that's the spatial resolution. Can it be done in situ, and is the machine portable? Well, um, I wouldn't be giving this talk, talk on this topic if I hadn't believed that it is Raman microscopy which is the best of all of these techniques. But like all walks of life in science, it's, you, you're always better if you use more than one technique to solve some problem. Well, let me just move on a little bit and just show you one or two um, Raman spectra for key materials. Red lead, minium. PB304 is a well-known inorganic material. It's actually a mixed valence material, which is of 
great interest in many respects, and it's one of many of the lead materials which are used and are very good, but you really do need to see, keep hydrogen sulphide away because hydrogen sulphide attacks these ones and gives you lead sulphide, which is black. And that has happened to many extraordinarily valuable materials where there's some H2S either from the air has come in from burning of coal fires or lamps in the street in the old days, or even from microbes that consume sulfur-containing binders and generate it in situ. So there is a certain problem, but here's, here's um, a Persian miniature from 1550. There's the red lead here. It's very widely used, it is, and it's a wonderful pigment. This is its Raman spectrum. Um, there's no difficulty at all in differentiating it from litharge, which is PBO and yellow, or massicot PBO, which is also yellow. And so you can see the specificity is, is there and very easy to, to study. Another one that I wanted to say something in a bit more detail about is lapis lazuli. This is a blue mineral, complex rock mix mixture containing calcite, pyrites, and the blue part of it, the blue mineral part of it, which is lazurite. And it has essentially this composition. It's a, an aluminosilicate and found in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Now, its structure is very similar to that of sodalite, which is this, that it's a cubic uh, material. This is what it looks like. This is the, the mineral, and these are the lazurite, the brilliant lazurite <coughs> grains, which have been crystals which have been used as a pigment since the 6th century in parts of Asia and as a semi-precious gemstone to, to the present day. If you walk down Bond Street, you can certainly pick it up for uh, a certain amount of money. And the crystal structure of this has been known for a long time. This shows the sort of cubic cage, aluminosilicate cage. Um, these are the um, aluminium oxygen aluminium cage units, um, and that goes out in three dimensions in the same way. And in the center of the cage is a hole. Now, there's not much in that hole, we know, because uh, more than 99% of the material of um, lazurite is actually aluminosilicate. There's less than 1% of something else. We know there's sulfur there, but it clearly is not present as sulfur itself, because that's yellow. And, in fact, we know what that is um, through studying all sorts of things. This is the electronic spectrum of um, lazurite. There's a very big, what we would call an absorption band here, centered on around 600 nanometers. And another one up here, just into the, going into the UV. Now, it's this band which determines the color, of course, because that's wiping out, that's absorbing all the red light incident upon the crystals and allowing the blue to transmit. And so that's why it looks blue. And there's also a second one up there just into the ultraviolet. We can actually see uh, through out to about um, 800 nanometers. Actually, how far you can see that way depends on how old you are. You, you, you start crunching in at both ends as you get older. You'll see 800 nanometers if you're 25. Now, and this, this up here is an indication of the different laser lines that you can use. And I need to indicate that you get different spectra um, with different laser lines. At least the intensities of the bands are different. And if you use a laser line that falls within the compass of an absorption band, that's called a resonance Raman spectrum. And what it really means is, it's, is that it's orders of magnitude more intense um, than a normal Raman spectrum. And so the resonance Raman spectrum is ideal for the study of materials in very low concentrations. That is, the sulfur species in, that's captured within the framework of the um, aluminosilicate of lazurite. And I don't intend to discuss this in any detail, but just show you the signature of the species responsible for the color, which is actually S3 minus. It's a, it's a bent, very little thing, bent thing, SSS, carrying one negative charge 
It's a radical, what we call a radical anion. And the marker of that is this band called nu1, which is the symmetric stretch of the S31 minus. Always Raman active. And you see harmonics of it. Twice that, three times that, four times, five times. So that's the marker of S3 minus. Um, and the interesting thing is that under these resonance conditions, you see this information about the S3 minus ion, but nothing from the host, the sodium aluminosilicate, which comprises more than 99% of the mass of lazurite. This particular technique homes in on the chromophore, the part of the molecule that um, is responsible for the color. You get the same spectrum, curiously, if you take sulfides in hexamethylphosphoramide or in dimethylformamide, very ionic liquids, very strange liquids, very ionic, you pick up the same progressions out here, five out to six. Um, you get the same thing from <coughs> sulfur and, and sulfides entrapped in alkali metal halides. You get the same thing if you take KNCS, potassium, potassium thiocyanate, and melt it. It goes blue. And so clearly S3- minus is uh, the species responsible for that color. And it occurs uh, in the degradation of KNCS in the melt. So that's, that's the, 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 the amazing thing about this particular little iron, which is responsible for this magnificent blue color for lazurite. It's, it's uh, known, prized, and it's the most valuable of the blue pigments here. And I've sh I show it in this particular slide, the, the blue. But the other interesting thing is that you can change the species pre that's trapped in that sodalite lattice. And if you modify the, che the chemistry there, you can get different radicals caught in the host, and you can get green, get violet, you can get pink, which was used in talcum powder. And if you switch to selenium from sulfur, you can get this one, this brick red one, which is ultramarine selenium. So all of these things uh, form a basis for a whole uh, different pigments industry. Ricketts Colors used to be interested in this, but then for more than a century. But actually, they've sold out to a French company now, so Hull, the Hull streets are no longer blue. The one thing about ultramarine blue is that if, if it's on the ground, you can't sweep it up. You can sweep however hard you like, but it forms very small sub-micrometer grains, and uh, all the streets around that Ricketts used to be blue. Now, I want to move on then and start to tell you something about the, the really famous works of art that we've had a chance to look at. And one of these is the Lindisfarne Gospels, going back to 715 AD. Um, this is absolutely brilliant artwork um, made uh, by a Bishop Eadfrith, who was the Bishop of Lindisfarne, Holy Island. And it was made there um, in this particular island monastery as, as a tribute to St. Cuthbert. And this is one of the pages. This is the St. Jerome's prefatory letter to uh, Pope Damasus on his Latin Vulgate translation. So this, this is what we managed to get a laser onto. Now, I'm not a Latin scholar. In fact, um, I think I took one day's Latin, and that wasn't sufficient, and I've forgotten all of that, but I can get through two words here. It goes through, that's N-O-V-U-M-O-P-U-S, new work. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the, the design features in this, which are absolutely brilliant. The colouring is brilliant, the reproduction is not quite right uh, in, in this slide, but uh, nevertheless, it gives a pretty good idea of what's going on. And so this, this is typical of um, the particular work by Eadfrith. Now, I want also to draw attention to the interlinear gloss. Now, interlinear means between the lines, and gloss in, in old 
meaning of that word was translation. So in between the lines, you find um, the Old English translation of the Latin uh, by Aldred, and that was made about 240 years later. So um, that, that's that particular page. This is the Cairo page, the, the Christ page, the first two letters of Christ. Again, extremely intricate, wonderful designs shown there. And this is the, the picture of the, the um, evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, with the, the sort of symbols behind in here of each, the, of man, the lion, uh, the eagle, and the ox. Now, these are, look surprisingly modern to me, and it's a, it's, I find it astonishing that works of this caliber could be produced as long ago as 715. Well, we have studied this. There are a string of different pigments found there. Not all of them could be identified, um, particularly some of the dyes, which look as if they come from vegetable life of some sort, plants. Um, originally, what was thought to be on here was decided by somebody who, who looked at it visually. And <clears throat> he probably said, I think it's... X, Y, and Z are the pigments on this. <clears throat> and then that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's been quoted and eventually translated into established. So people believed what the original um, statements were. But in fact, they're not all correct by any means. If you look at this, every, everybody thought that the insular palette was uh, adopted. That is, orpiment, red lead, and verdigris in all these early manuscripts. There are more pigments on it than that. <clears throat> there are certainly Virgo, which is a mixture of indigo and orpiment, and there's also red ochre, which is a sort of um, uh, hematite, iron oxide. And um, the main point of our study, in fact, was that we could not find any lazurite there. Now, that's interesting because this was one... Um, weakness, really, of the original identifications is that to, for Lazarite to be there, and it could only come from Afghanistan, there had to be a trade route set up by 715 AD through to the northeast corner of Northumberland. And, in, and that's in 715 AD. And that's a little bit difficult to um, believe. In fact, we now know from looking at many other Anglo-Saxon manuscripts and um, European manuscripts that, in fact, that it's more than 200 years later that uh, we have evidence for Lazarite being used uh, in, in manuscripts of this sort. So this is a, a bit like the... Um, this conclusion is, is a bit like the Conan Doyle one, the, the inspector with um, Sherlock Holmes. The inspector says, well what was significant about what you discovered. And Holmes says, uh, the dog. And the inspector says, the dog didn't do anything. And Holmes says, um, that was what was significant. Here, what's significant is that Lazarite is not there, and you don't, you don't need to propose um, that the trade route was established as early as that. Well, if you move on to 825, we looked at something called the Tours Gospel, which also is in the British Library. And this consists of an oak panel. This is the cover, actually, of it. And this consists of an oak panel with silver, embossed silver on it. There's Limoges um, enamel in each of the corners. And there are 12 gemstones all there. So we could look at this. And there's no difficulty in identifying the gemstones. There's amethyst and... Um, emerald, iron garnet, and sapphire form these particular gemstones. Um, and that's easy to see. And also, there's some very fine writing on it and illumination of this particular sort. The, this great big B is well illuminated, and we've looked at many parts of this particular manuscript. And the important thing is that there's actually no Lazarite, even in 825, on, on that one. We did find 
carbon black, indigo, lead white, medium, orpiment, and vermilion. And there are the Raman spectra of those. They are highly indicative of what's found. Now, we move on to 1200. And we managed to um, have brought to us from the Bodleian Library um, this, this Arabic treatise, the Book of Curiosities of the Sciences, which has early maps and celestial diagrams on it. Um, it has, in particular, many, many, well, two world maps and other maps, and it, it includes unique maps of the five great rivers of, of the ancient world, the, the Nile, the Euphrates, Tigris, Oxus, and Indus rivers. I have to say, the, the actual maps wouldn't be any use really to anybody. Their, their scale is so small and so s schematic. It's very hard, even with an atlas, to, to trace and make sure that these old maps really are what they pertain to, what e are, really are what they are thought to be. However, here's a map of Sicily. Um, now, one has to say it's, it's pretty difficult to pick this as Sicily. E even, even if you go into the business and, and, and uh, the fine detail of reading the writing that's round here, and uh, there's a complication with Arab maps that some of them have uh, north to the bottom rather than the top, but I'm assured, and I was not terribly sure myself, but this one apparently does have north to the top, and... Um, it got, and it appears that the, what the Arabs did was decide how many name places they wanted and then spread them all around evenly um, without bothering too much about um, distance. And so that's really what I drew attention to up here, that they're very schematic. Um, but we, we looked at many of these and many pictures of uh, comets in the, in the sky that they have. And the, we've identified these particular pigments here. And the point of interest in this case was, was there any difference between the palette assumed by secular work, such as this, and the palette of Korans, of which many we have studied over a long period of time? And in fact, we can see no difference. There seems to be a commonality of usage of all these pigments. Well, let's move to... Another step now to 1455 to the Gutenberg Bibles. Now, Johann Gutenberg is considered responsible for the invention of printing in Europe using movable and reusable type. And this was a really major development. He printed about 180 of these, and there are about 45 uh, left, more or less, intact. And we've managed to have a look at eight of these, um, some indirectly and one directly. And again, these are Bibles containing Latin translations of the Hebrew Old and the Greek New Testaments. Um, there are model books. These are books which say to the illuminator, because Gutenberg didn't do the illumination, he, people just came and bought the actual uh, Bible and then took it away and, depending on how rich they were, decided which pigments to put on. So they're done in different places. And the, but the model books contain guidance, um, but not all of it, the guidance is, is correct because there were a lot of ambiguities in terminology in that, at that time. The best of these, actually, is the George III Bible, which is in the British Library, available for anyone to see. You can walk straight in the main entrance, go up to the mezzanine floor, and you will see the George III Bible. You will also see the electronic version of it where you can turn over every page electronically. Uh, it's very easy and well worth a visit to see. This um, was acquired from Würzburg by George III, somewhere around 1800, they think, and when he died, it was bequeathed um, to the British Museum Library as it was then, and now it's down Euston Road. Well, the prologue page of this and page one of Genesis in this copy is illuminated with images of foliage, flowers, animals, fruits, and whatnot, as you can see here. Again, it's absolutely brilliant illumination. And so it dates from this particular time, 1455, and this is the prologue page, volume one. 
we've looked at this very carefully uh, with um, the laser Raman system we have. But of course, there's a problem with something like this. It's very big and very heavy, and it won't go under a microscope. So you have to build a particular stage to hold the thing up. And I'll show you that in a minute. And this, it's a question of laser heads over the Bible. These are the pigments which we found on this particular instance. And this shows the thing in operation. And here's the actual stage. There's the, the Bible open. And there's a smaller laser we're using here, which goes back to the spectrometer, which is out of, out of sight. And the laser is shooting down onto one of these illuminations and collecting the Raman radiation up another light fiber. So it's obviously nowhere near as um, effective as using a Raman microscope, but nevertheless, you can do it, and you can get the signals back, and I make these identifications. You can also study what's called uh, gutter sweepings, an inglorious term, I think, but there you are. It's the, these are the droppings of, of the uh, pigment from adjacent pages when they've been opened and shut. They sort of act like sandpaper a bit on each other, and some drops down between the, um, between the folds and into the gutter. And you can collect that, and you can look at it. And we've done that also for this one, in, and you find exactly the same pigments. But it's a, you have to be a bit more cautious in case someone has dropped something in between a page. Um, they're never opened completely, so you never lose those gutter sweepings. Well, we have looked then at eight of, of these, but the other ones have been done via gutter sweepings because they wouldn't, of course, bring them to us. There's one in Eton College, which is very fine, another one, very fine one, in Lambeth Palace. And we've, we've studied uh, two from... Two from um, France, two from Germany, and one from the Getty. Now, we're still, the, we've still got these under study, actually, at the present time, and just trying to see if there's something different about um, pigment, pigment usage uh, in different parts. Another item of interest, which was much more recent, uh, is this Vermeer painting which came up for sale in 2004. Well, there are only 35 paintings at the time which were considered authentic of Vermeer's. So if a 36 turned up, that, that was big news. And this one, entitled Young Woman Seated at a Virginal, was also thought to be a Vermeer. But the, the problem is that nearly all the Vermeers are in museums and um, in royal collections, and very few are in private hands. And this one that came up was in private hands. And there had been a scare about Vermeers at the uh, end of the Second World War, with the Dutch wanting to look to see if there were any collaborators within Holland. And this particular person was tracked down because Goering had a Vermeer that they didn't know about. And so they got this Vermeer, and all the Dutch experts studied this extremely carefully, and said, yes, it's a Vermeer. We haven't got a record of it, but it's definitely Vermeer. So they traced it back, and the person who, who originally uh, sold it was this chap, Han van Meegeren. So they had him up for collaboration. And after much uh, kerfuffle, he eventually pleaded that uh, they weren't Vermeers at all. He painted them. <laughs> uh, of course, the, the, the court didn't believe him, and he said, okay, put me in prison, bring me all the materials, and I'll paint you one. And, and he did. And he painted one in prison. Of a, and um, the experts came along and said, well, we have to eat humble pie. We wouldn't know that this wasn't uh, a Vermeer. The Dutch then recharged him for forgery. <laughs> and, 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 and he died in prison, unfortunately. So, I mean, this, this put a cloud, of course, on, on any other um, Vermeers that were in private hands. So this particular one came up, came up for auction, and here it is. We had it in the laboratory. Um, not very big, as you see. And UCL people studied this in great detail, especially the history of art people, 
looked, looked and studied that for the better part of 10 years in all sorts of ways, and built up quite a lot of information about, about the painting, all supportive, actually. And one of the most interesting is that the thread count on the canvas um, is 12 per centimetre, both warp and weft, which is exactly the same as in Vermeer's The Lace Maker, that's in the Louvre. And also the same gram material was used. So finally they thought, uh, they came to us just to see whether there was anything unusual about the pigments. Well, there were only, there were only two of, of significance. One was lazurite, and we were absolutely certain this, this was the um, mineral material, not the synthetic material, which was made from 1828 onwards. So there was a crude date marker there. And then we found lead tin yellow type 1 on it, PB2 SNO4, which was only really used in the period 1450 to 1700. So those two observations are supportive. They certainly don't prove it's a Vermeer. Um, but um, and this shows the lapis lazuli. Uh, that's the mineral form, and the other side shows the synthetic form, which is much smaller and, and more rounded and evenly distributed. So that was then sold, as you saw on an earlier slide. I mean, it, amazing. Sold at Sotheby's. £2.2 .2 million pounds was the opening bid. Two and a bit minutes later, the hammer came down at £16.2 million. Pounds. You, know, you could fund the whole of the university system with bids of this sort. So, but nevertheless, um, so somebody believes it's genuine then. We didn't say it was genuine, we just said it's consistent with being genuine. And in any case, we couldn't say more because you go, it takes you back to Popper, who posits that scientific hypotheses can never be confirmed as true and are acceptable only insofar as they manage to survive frequent attempts to falsify them. <laughs> and so that's the situation here. Um, Popper did spend time uh, during the Second World War at Canterbury. Um, my father actually did hear him lecture on economics there. He was also at Canterbury. And, and then, of course, he came to London and was famous as a, an economist and all sorts of other things. So that needs bearing in mind. Now, postage stamps. Also works of art. Wonderful. Mauritius, rather improbably, was the the fifth country in the world in the same year as USA, actually, to issue postage stamps in 1847, seven years after the UK did. And there's the one penny one with red lead on it, PB304, and the tuppenny one with Prussian blue on it. Now, that's, a, that's this particular pigment. It's a, first made in 1704, so there's no dating problem here. And this, this has um, iron two... Um, NC iron 3 in it. It's got, and it's uh, three dimensional, it's got the lattice the same in all directions, and is a wonderful blue. Now, there's no problem with the original two stamps. But in 1858, there was a new issue brought out, and that's shown here. You'll note that the stamps have no denomination on them. The denomination was indicated by the colour. And in essence, this was one penny, tuppenny, fourpenny, sixpenny, ninepenny. But there's no denomination on it. So there was a possibility of forgery. And the big problem they had was that there seemed to be a lot more fourpenny ones knocking about <laughs> than were ever made. And uh, this, this caused a problem. So we, again, this is, uh, these, these are from the um, British Library collection, the Royal Philatelic Society collection, and also actually from the Queen's collection. We also studied some of hers. Um, and the focusing on, and these two are the pigments I've already mentioned. This one was a little bit tricky to see, and it turned out to be chrome green. Now that's lead chromate, um, which is yellow, uh, mixed in with another material altogether. And, in fact, the other material uh, is this, the, um, the Prussian blue. And I, I realized that, looking at this rather complicated Raman spectrum, that it was a mixture of two different pigments. And then they simply demonstrated what the forgers must have done. They get a, a slurry of lead chromate, just paint it over the top here, let it dry. And because these are sub-micrometer grains, 
the, the overlaying stuff drops down between the blue and the eye can't see things as small as one micrometer anyway. You just get the impression of green. So that was quite clever, and it was difficult, to, but it still is difficult to see the, the difference between um, the forged ones, which were made with already, the already mixed two pigments, and um, uh, the forgery ones. And you have to go down the, the edge very carefully to see any mismatched as a way of telling what's going on there. There are minute dis misalignments of colours at the edges. In, in other stamps of interest that we looked at were the Hawaiian missionary postage stamps, um, because there are a lot of forgeries of these. The, the Grinnell missionaries are famous. Um, there are some sold in 1918, 43 sold for $65,000 then. That's big money in those days. And they're still, the family still have these, despite the court case in 1922, and they came again to the Royal Philatelic Society, who've judged them again to be forgeries. And we had a look at uh, these. This is the Hawaiian 13-cent um, stamp, and you can see the reddish franking marks, and which are um, a vermilion lead sulfide mix, uh, um, mercury sulfide mix, there's also some black lead carbon. Um, and we had to look at the cross-section of this particular stamp to see what was going on. And this is the surface, and these are, these are the paper fibres. And on the surface is the Prussian blue, which you can easily find on the surface there. But there was another crystal over here, which is lazurite, or ultramarine blue, actually ultramarine blue. And... That's there in the genuine ones, but not always found in the, in the forged ones. And the, the lazurite is in there as a, an optical brightener. And those of, us who are, those of you who are old enough to remember the whites being washed in, in copper tubs and rickets blue thrown in to disperse the grain all through so that the yellowing of the whites is, um, is counteracted by the blue of the rickets blue, which is the ultramarine blue, will recognise what an optical brightener is. Well, they were doing that in the paper, and that's, that's essentially in the um, genuine ones. But the forged ones had ordinary paper with no optical brightener in. So you can tell the difference. So that's quite a subtle difference, but there were some more blatant differences in some other cases. I did have a call from an Egyptian a few years ago saying he wanted some papyri authenticated uh, I told him that it's not possible to authenticate anything. Uh, I can tell you if it's not authentic, but not if it is. He wasn't interested in being bothered with details. <laughs> and and he, he came. In fact, he came, four of them, four people came, in the biggest black Mercedes known to man. And visitors to the chemistry department at UCL don't usually travel in that way. Um, and he turned up, and he came in with six of them, actually, and after a long discussion, and actually this dis discussion went over, on over many meetings, um, it turned out that um, he had 100 of these, which he valued at £2 million each. So, well, we agreed to look at two of them, and uh, Lucia Bergio, who may be in the audience, doing a PhD with me at the time, was very keen to look at um, these sorts of things. So she had a look. This is one showing um, a lotus bush. This, is, this shows um, Nefertari. So I said to Lucia, have a look at the white on, on this dress. So she had a look at it, and um, it was Anatase. And she carried on and looked at lots of things. And uh, there was gypsum there, red earth, calcite. And there's not necessarily a problem with Anatase, because it is a mineral. Uh, that's fine. But this particular Anatase is dead white and exactly akin to what you get from modern industrial titanium dioxide, which is in all paint. We'll be surrounded with it in this room. Um, you make it and sell it by how white it is. Um, he was unimpressed with my information, actually, and, and, but I wasn't terribly bothered, and there, there were, there's a long, a long and lot of discussion over all of this. But the long and the short of this was that there were... Um, seven modern pigments on board this. There was no ground, and uh, it included thalassinine blue, 
first made in Manchester in 1936, and this is all supposed to be 1250 BC. So there's a, there, there was a real problem there, and I thought I'd got... <laughs> he disappeared elsewhere. And we, this, look, looking at this gave me an end to the Petrie Museum at UCL, and we looked at that, and the provost, if he's managed to get here from uh, the meeting he has at Downing Street at the, at the moment, will be pleased to know that the Petrie Museum papyri... Um, have nothing but good about them. They're all, all mineral materials, which is no problem. I had one other venture, unfortunately, with papyri. The, a person, I, uh, a very distinguished person in, the, in uh, America said he bought a very important piece of papyrus from Luxor, from a very reputable uh, shop. And he, he wanted to know whether to mention it in his will. And he, brought, he <laughs> flew it over here to London to have a look at. But I didn't manage to get... We didn't manage to get the Raman machine on, onto it. We didn't need to, because under a microscope, it had rows of red dots, rows of yellow dots, and rows of blue dots. It was quite, quite clearly the product of an inkjet printer. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm about to run out of time, so I'll just say one other thing here on the serious side, because we have looked at many um, icons. Um, partly to do with uh, Mount Athos that I managed to visit uh, once. Um, this amazing, uh, amazing place, which supposedly has had no female at it for a thousand years, not even a female cat. And, and many, uh, there are many wonderful icons there, and next door to it, just on the mainland, is this uh, place called Ormilia, uh, where there's a convent... Um, a very scientific convent where the, uh, the nuns are very well qualified. They all had BSCs. They're all, they have a vast range of scientific equipment for studying icons, and they do an amazing job there. Well, this particular one here uh, was of interest because uh, they wanted to do a restoration, and this is just to illustrate the problems here. Some of these have been overpainted. Uh, you can see what's underneath um, through the cracks, and you can bring a laser beam down through this, and you can usually see from the edges what's there. Um, and so there's an underlayer of various pigments, there's a, another layer, there's a varnish, and there's an overpainting. And the overpainting includes lithopone, which is zinc sulfide plus barium sulfate, which is a modern pigment. So this particular slide shows what matters here. Here's the, uh, here's the wood, then you see the first layer, the second layer, the varnish layer, and the overpainting layer. And we can very easily actually get Raman spectra. Uh, there's number one, is, is here, that's Caput Mortuum, uh, a, a reddish brown hematite sort of material. This is azurite, number two. Number three up here is... Uh, uh, carbon, and number four is the lithopone that you see up here. So all of these things in cross-section can be identified. So if you want to really take the thing back to the original, you can do that, and you know what to put back uh, with it. Well, there are many other things that we have studied, and I haven't time to do it. I haven't done archaeology justice. We have at least as much material on archaeology. These are stuccos. We've looked at all sorts of things of archaeological interest. I just want to leave you with the, the thought that um, the, sci the science behind all of this is really important, and I would, I would very much like much more integration of museums and libraries and whatnot with the science world to take place. Um, there's so much that can be done, to, can be done together in, in this, and I, I think this is a way to go. I would like to see even items in galleries that quite correctly have the name of the, name of the painter, the year, the, the style, the country, the date, all that. I would like to see them have the names of the pigments there and realise that these things are works of science as well as works of art.
Well, we have time for a few questions. Um, can we get our New Zealand friends back to see if they would have a question? Yes. Um, do we have any questions from uh, New Zealand? Professor, Professor John Spencer, Victoria University of Wellington. <laughs> Good evening, Robin. Thank you very much for a, a very interesting lecture. Um, you um, explained extremely well, I think, the application of Raman spectroscopy to the non-destructive identification of the inorganic pigments. Um, and I think it was slide six, you mentioned um, the issue of fluorescence with organic pigments and, and other organic materials. Would you like to comment on the issues uh, around fluorescence? Well, this is something which has got better with time, as it were, because the, de the detectors we use now, as I already said, um, are much, much faster than the old ones, which means we we can use much lower powers of laser beam. And so we don't excite uh, as much fluorescence, we don't cause as much bother. But nevertheless, there are still um, dyes and pigments which may fluoresce. And if you really uh, want to do something about it in a big way, you need to go to time-resolved spectroscopy, and, uh, which involves pulsing a beam onto the surface collecting the Raman spectrum, and then gating it, shutting it off, so that the fluorescence, which is a much slower phenomenon coming out than, than the Raman is, which is instantaneous. So you pulse, gate, and collect. Pulse, gate, and collect, and carry on doing that. And uh, there's David Phillips in the audience here, who's an expert in doing that sort of thing. And that, that is extremely successful, actually, in solving this particular problem because of the difference in time, time lapse between a Raman e emanating out and the fluorescence. Can we have one more question from New Zealand? Uh, yes, the second question will be asked by Professor Kenneth McKenzie from Victoria University of Wellington. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask a question regarding future developments, possible future developments in this spectroscopic technique, or for that matter, related uh, techniques, which might enhance the, uh, the whole area of, uh, of, of identification and so on. And coupled with that, um, whether there are any pigments that are not amenable to Raman, uh, that do not give a Raman signal, and if so, uh, how this problem might be addressed in the future? Well, let me take the second part first. Every chemical compound has a Raman spectrum. That's a fact of life. It's just a question of whether you can see and detect the spectrum. And that's where, again, it comes back to the, these charge coupled device detectors. They're so much faster that there's many fewer um, pigments and dyes that we can't detect now. And so if, if the astronomers can make even better ones, we would be even more grateful, Martin. Mm -hmm. So I hope, I hope that will happen. But that's, that's the important thing. We must be able to co collect the signal. I mean, the, the Raman intensity... Of, of a particular vibration is related to the nature of the chemical bond. For the chemists there will know that you have ionic bonds and covalent bonds. The covalent ones have a lot of electron density between the atoms. And when they vibrate, the electron density changes, and that's equivalent to a polarizability change, which is converted into Raman intensity. If you have ionic materials like sodium chloride and such like, um, they're essentially sodium plus and chloride minus. Each has a polarizability. If they did vibrate against each other, since nothing's shared, there's no polarizability change. That's put extremely crudely, but um, there is something intrinsic there that some, some materials will scatter Raman radiation very effectively. The very covalent type of things, such as um, iodine or, or titanium tetrachloride, and they're very, they're very different from the ionic ones, such as china clay and things of that sort. Now, I lost, the, I lost mm. track of the... Right. 
Uh, I think we ought to have some questions from the home team now. Uh, please um, uh, stand up and wait till the microphone gets to you. This is uh, David Phillips. Robin, uh, in, at least in the early days, uh, Raman spectroscopy used pretty high-powered lasers, and you're firing such things at uh, priceless objects. I just wondered how persuasive you had to be to get the curators <laughs> to allow you to, uh, to, to, to do this. Well, of course, what we, what we do is uh, um, we can guess what the pigment is anyway, or we look at it, and we take a whole whole range of different powders on the, on the side and see how much power they all take. And most, most of these, um, I think all of them, we know what limiting power is. And we'll go down to a hundredth of that when we go to look at a, a particular valuable manuscript. And so I, I, don't, I don't think it's a, a problem that, on that. We, we've not knowingly damaged anything. <laughs> Another question? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Hi, Robin. Um, can you carry on and speak a little bit about damage and changes of pigments with time? Well, some, some do degrade with time. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and as I alluded to earlier, the lead pigments are particularly susceptible to this because of the, uh, the uh, hydrogen sulfide, even at low concentration in the atmosphere can attack um, especially lead white. Now, I didn't have, although I, 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 I'm tempted to run on, but I think I'm blocked out. I do have uh, some shots of materials which, in which there is lead white, which has been put onto a painting to highlight something. I have a wonderful shot of a hand in which the knuckles are all, have all got lead white on, except that they're black. So what was highlighted is now black-lighted, as it were, by, by just a few micrometers of lead sulphide on the surface. And that has made a, a tremendous difference. So the question is, ke can you keep it out? Well, you can pro we, we no longer, as I, I say, burn um, sulfur, sulfurous coal to keep the the uh, building's warm, um, so you're not likely to have H2S in the atmosphere that way, but there's, it, it's going to be a problem getting rid of, of the microbes that can eat the binder, with, which has got sulphur in it, and generate H2S that way, unless one makes quite sure that one's treated um, all these materials for microbes of some sort or other and killed them off. Um, one more question? Um, yes. Can you wait for the microphone? Right. No, Robin, a, a comment and then a question. Uh, somebody said in the early days you used lasers. In the very early days, one used horrible mercury arcs, and we used photographic plates as detectors, and it was not uncommon to f expose a photographic plate for hours or even days to get one a Raman spectrum. And I make this historical comment just to show how remarkable it is what can be done and what you're doing with a laser and a microscope. Now the question, when you have an ordinary uh, stage on a microscope and you want to do an XY examination, you've got accurate micrometers on the stage. Now when you're doing an XY examination of a large sample, are you XYing the laser beam very accurately, or you, are you XYing the, the book or the Bible accurately? Uh, well, the really intimate work of this sort is, is done with um, uh, medicinal pills to try and identify uh, where, where the active ingredient is and, and how much is, it, is uh, the filler, the excipient. And uh, then you, you have a motorised stage, as you say, and that is very, that the laser isn't moved, but the motorized stage is tracked across, and you could build up 10,000 Raman spectra of one pill, and you know exactly where all the active ingredients are. And uh, th this, is, this is big business, of course, to the um, medicinal companies, and uh, they fight each other furiously over patent rights on these sorts of matters. 
but it, it can be done. It's done extremely accurately. Thank you. We could go on a long time, but I think we ought to conclude soon. Before we finally close, there is some administration to be done in that there is a tangible recognition uh, which is awarded to the uh, uh, Bakerian lecturer. And it's in three parts. Uh, there's a scroll. There is a medal. And there is a brown envelope. I'd like to say uh, uh, goodbye to our colleagues in New Zealand. It's been a great privilege to have this uh, live two-way link. So thank you very much for being with us. And can I also conclude by uh, expressing on behalf of everyone, everyone here and everyone in New Zealand, our deep appreciation for what has been a fascinating interdisciplinary lecture, uh, which I think has uh, hit the mark for this mixed audience absolutely ideally which we've meant for a long time and for which we are deeply grateful. So thank you very much indeed, Robert.